Welcome to our third and final session for today, Over the Counter and Through the Woods, Navigating Analgesics at Discharge. My name is Liz Olson, and I'm the Director of Quality Programs Management with the American Heart Association. A brief reminder that you'll have the opportunity to submit text questions for today's presenters using the Q&A feature. You may send in your questions at any time, and we'll review the questions during our Q&A at the end of each presentation as time allows. Today's slides are also available for download. You can view the slides from each of today's sessions by clicking on the sessions listed on the agenda page. All sessions will be recorded and available within the next few weeks. It's my pleasure to introduce our final speakers for today, Dr. Brittany Johnson and Dr. Sophia Shake. Dr. Johnson is the Pain and Palliative Care Stewardship Pharmacist at the University of Florida Health Jacksonville and a Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. Dr. Johnson's clinical practice includes the inpatient acute pain service under the Department of Anesthesia and the palliative care service. Apart from her clinical role, Dr. Johnson collaborates with administrative and clinical teams to improve pain management practices within the organization through policy development, medication use evaluations, as well as quality and educational initiatives. She is the president-elect for the Northeast Florida Society of Health System Pharmacists. Dr. Johnson is joined by Dr. Sophia Shake. Dr. Shake is an associate professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville. She is a board certified emergency medicine physician with sub board certification in medical toxicology. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's also the medical director at the Florida U.S. Virgin Islands Poison Information Center. She has numerous publications and national presentations related to pain, poison prevention and management, and patient safety. Dr. Sheikh also has, <clears throat> has also collaborated with national and state pain organizations and developed several clinical and patient safety tools and resources related to improving pain management. Dr. Johnson will begin the presentation. Dr. Johnson, the floor is yours. Dr. Shake and I personally have nothing to disclose. However, some of the material that will be presented to you later in the presentation is sourced from the Pain Assessment and Management Initiative Program, and our funders are listed here for your reference. Our presentation objectives for today will be to discuss the long and short term use of over the counter pain medications and highlight those considerations for high risk and special populations, um, especially those with comorbidities. We'll also evaluate when we should be recommending our patients to follow up with their clinicians after utilizing these OTC pain relievers and recognize the possible adverse reactions um, to these agents and their symptom presentation for patient awareness. Lastly, we'll go into some techniques and methodologies for patient education um, related to pain medications at discharge. And then we'll take into account some considerations for what items you may want to include at your facility for a patient discharge toolkit. So I took this picture about a month ago um, at one of the local retail pharmacies, and um, I did it just to emphasize the abundance of options and multiple dosage formulations and combination products that our patients face when they approach the aisle looking for an over-the-counter or as I'll refer to it here on out as an OTC um, analgesic. So I think it's really important for us uh, as healthcare team members to really echo home to the patient the importance of understanding these products. <clears throat> First being acetaminophen. Um, so this is kind of a gold standard agent, especially for those patients with osteoarthritis. This is our first line agent. Um, one of the things that complicates this agent is that it comes in so many different dosage forms, as I've listed out here. It's, it's good in a way um, for those patients that don't want to take tablets or liquid gels. Um, we've got dissolving packets, we've got liquid options galore, but that does uh, create some complication when it comes to dosing. So the main thing with this agent is to, is to note that when we're talking about over-the-counter dosing, um, a maximum of three grams per day or in a 24-hour period is going to be the limit for OTC um, 
utilization. Now that's different from what you see on the inpatient side where we would use up to four milligrams or 4,000 milligrams per day. Um, and that's just out of caution um, through the FDA making that adjustment for OTC utilization. And that's out of concern for risk of severe liver damage um, when we're consuming greater than four grams per day. Um, this risk also increases with alcohol use. So greater than three alcohol uh, drinks per day while taking acetaminophen uh, significantly increases patient risk. Now, when we talk about liver disease, you know, it's really like 1% of the total population that's consuming acetaminophen that will experience um, liver disease due to acetaminophen toxicity. Um, however, when we look at, you know, acute uh, liver failure, 50% of those cases in the U.S. are made from individuals that overconsumed acetaminophen products. So still a very important education point for your patients. When to consult a provider is also um, a gray area to many patients. So we want to be clear that if symptoms worsen or um, if they improve but then reoccur, um, then they need to see their provider. And also, if there's any redness or swelling associated with the site, uh, that could be an indicator for cellulitis or something more complicated going on, which would prompt a discussion with the provider. But the hard and fast rule is any pain that's lasting greater than a 10-day period, we would recommend the patient um, consult a provider. Also, uh, as I mentioned, these combination products um, can be very confusing to the patient. So making sure that they're clear that they can't take any prescribed or over-the-counter products that contain acetaminophen in conjunction with um, the standard dosing acetaminophen is going to be very important because that cumulative dose does add up. And that's how oftentimes we end up getting over the maximum dosage. So we'll start with a case presentation. Tom is a 55-year-old male being discharged home after a fall from a ladder with minor injuries. He's participating with physical therapy and he rates his pain a 4 out of 10. He doesn't want any opioids when he goes home, but he asks the provider if he can take acetaminophen that he has at home for his knee. What are some of the counseling points that we should consider? Great. So max of three grams per day. Avoid alcohol use while taking this medication. And make sure you're reading all your labels to ensure that you're not taking any concomitant acetaminophen from other sources. Next up, we have aspirin. And <clears throat> aspirin is a very common agent, as you know, for patients with cardiac disease, usually, usually utilized at the lower doses of 81 milligrams a day. Um, however, for analgesia, we can use up to 3,900 milligrams in a 24-hour period. Risks to be concerned about are similar with other NSAIDs in that um, GI bleed for patients over 60, those with a history of stomach ulcers or bleed problems, um, or individuals taking any other concomitant NSAIDs um, have an increased risk of bleed. What, what symptoms should a patient look for related to this? Well, black tarry stools, feeling faint, um, any hyper any emesis uh, with blood in it, um, or if they're having stomach pain that is not resolving, um, or any new symptoms that are occurring um, need to be reported to their physician. If the patients are taking any medications for gout, diabetes, or arthritis, um, there is a significant profile of adverse uh, drug-drug interactions that can occur. So it's very important to um, either look at this as a provider or check with a pharmacist um, before using multiple agents uh, with this class. And asthma or serious other chronic conditions um, can also be of concern outside of, you know, our typical GI concerns of stomach ulcer, GI bleed, heartburn. And that's mostly um, in patients that have you know, some underlying respiratory disease. So their risk of having a respiratory exacerbation increases by about 20% when aspirin is introduced. Whereas in a standard healthy patient, we're looking at a 1% risk of aspirin related respiratory um, complications. So definitely um, think about your patients with asthma um, or any other pulmonary condition when, when discussing this agent.
And then also something to consider is, you know, patients often go to the OTC products um, to try to self-manage their pain. And it's typically a, an acute situation. Um, and because of the delayed release formulation of aspirin, they're not likely to experience, you know, um, immediate relief from those symptoms. So this may not be the best option for analgesia in this case. When we look at the risk of combining low-dose aspirin with other NSAIDs, the literature is quite variable um, depending on what agent is being assessed as to uh, what level of risk we're talking about. So when we look at ibuprofen, um, we've, we've seen that it can bypass, you know, the um, irreversible platelet inhibition um, that is induced by aspirin and therefore make the patient uh, more likely to have a thromboembolic event. Um, naproxen has also been shown to interfere with this irreversible inhibitory effect um, on COX-1 of the platelets. Um, so there may be some risk there as well. Um, however, you know, really looking at any two concomitant NSAIDs, we're, we're considering the risk of competition for binding of those COX enzymes, um, altering that pharmacologic effect, and then therefore reducing that antiplatelet effect of low-dose aspirin. So um, it's very important to counsel patients to, if possible, avoid concomitant use. And if necessary, separating um, the NSAID from the aspirin by two hours um, prior to NSAID administration or four hours after um, that would be the recommendation for spacing it out. However, that that risk reduction really neutralizes when a uh, patient is taking the NSAID chronically with the aspirin. So we would want to use it at the lowest dose for the shortest duration possible, if necessary. Naproxen sodium is another <clears throat> over-the-counter NSAID agent that um, patients commonly use. There's um, a dosing standard of 220 milligrams um, that come in multiple dosage forms um, as listed above. So um, this is different from your standard Tylenol being, you know, every four to six to eight hours, whereas uh, the recommendations here are every eight to 12. Patients that don't experience relief in that first dose may repeat a dose of 220 milligrams within that first hour, um, but they're not to exceed three tablets per day or 660 milligrams per day. Similar risk of GI bleed is outlined here uh, as with, you know, the class effect of other NSAIDs. When we think about GI bleed risk, really it's dose and duration related. Um, so for patients, you know, taking healthy patients taking uh, naproxen for a six month period with a history of GI bleed, we're seeing an increased risk of, you know, 5%. So, um, just to give you kind of some perspective on a healthy patient versus individuals that have a past history, they do have a, a substantial increase in risk. Um, additionally, the patients with high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart or kidney disease, lots of comorbidities to consider here. So when we're talking about high blood pressure, we can anticipate anywhere from a five to seven millimeter mercury increase um, in patients that are taking these agents um, chronically. So definitely want to recommend to your patient to monitor blood pressure at home. And counseling points are going to be similar to that of the class. Um, stopping this agent if there's any stomach bleed, stopping the agent if there's any symptom of heart attack, which would be chest pain, difficulty breathing, any type of weakness on one side of the body. Um, and then lower extremity edema um, and slurred speech can also be an indicator of, of stroke as well. So when we're looking at cardiovascular risk, uh, specifically related to NSAIDs, um, <clears throat> Trell and colleagues completed a meta-analysis of looking at a large-scale randomized control trial group, uh, comparing any NSAIDs to other NSAIDs as well as placebo. I've outlined ibuprofen and naproxen here, um, as those are our main um, agents that would be available for analgesia over the counter most commonly. Our primary outcome was looking at the rate ratio of, of myocardial infarction 
um, and secondary outcomes, including stroke or death from cardiovascular disease or any mortality. There, um, had, there were 31 trials included with about 117,000 patients. And I've listed out the NSAIDs that were studied here. And of those that were evaluated, naproxen um, showed to be the most favorable uh, with the least harmful risk of cardiovascular um, complications. And you can see that here um, in this graph depicting um, the relative risk based on MI, stroke, cardiovascular death. Um, and so this really leans in favor to naproxen for those individuals. So let's do another case. Uh, Donald's a 65 year old male who presented to the hospital with complaints of severe headache, which he self-treated with OTC naproxen, 220 milligrams every eight hours for the last 72 hours. He was found to be in hypertensive urgency with an AKI. Donald's take, taking lisinopril 20 daily, hydrochlorothiazide 25 daily, and he was supposed to follow up with his primary care to continue titrating his blood pressure medications, but he hasn't been back in several months. So what could have contributed to Donald's acute kidney injury? Well, he's utilizing NSAIDs um, in combination with thiazide diuretics as well as ACE inhibitors, uh, which you know, his, the lisinopril and the hydrochlorothiazide um, can increase the risk of renal toxicity with those NSAIDs. And that increase in blood pressure um, with increase in bilateral swelling and edema um, may have also contributed to his hypertensive urgency. So um, very important to look at your, your patient's medication profile um, prior to recommending any of these OTC agents. When we talk about ibuprofen, um, <clears throat> Again, coming in many dosage forms. Um, this one is also uh, an exception to the inpatient rule. So much like acetaminophen, the over-the-counter dose cap for ibuprofen um, is going to be 1,200 milligrams in a 24-hour period. Whereas, you know, on the inpatient side, you may use 800 every eight hours. Um, so a a dose cap of 3,200 milligrams. So just really important to highlight to the patient the difference there, because um, when they transition home, their dosing may be altered. Um, the additional point I wanted to, to bring up with ibuprofen and really any of these NSAIDs um, is that they, they will increase the patient's INR by about 15%. That's to be expected with the concomitant use of these agents. And if you're talking about some of the newer agents outside of just warfarin, um, we still see an increase of about sixfold in the risk of GI bleed um, in, con in combination with ibuprofen and a, and a DOAC, for example. There is an age-associated uh, bleed risk as well. So um, when we're talking about bleed risk in patients less than 45 years old, we're, we're looking at more of like one in 2,000 patients. Where we see that significant bump is in patients over 75, where about one in 110 patients will have um, some risk of, of bleed. Now, the labeling um, on, on ibuprofen as well as um, these other NSAID agents doesn't outline uh, comprehensively all other disease states to take into account. So blood pressure, diabetes, liver, heart disease, asthma, past stroke, um, history of GI bleed, you know, we've discussed those. Um, but I would also caution you to look at other agents um, that may be less common on your radar. So if patients being treated for depression, for example, um, many of the antipsychotics and antidepressants will also interact with these agents and increase risk of bleed. So um, we just have to be comprehensive in our approach. I know that these seem like relatively benign agents being available over the counter, um, but in inappropriate use or inappropriate use with um, medications that are higher risk to interact um, can cause significant complications to patients. So Jane's a 25-year-old female who presents to clinic 
uh, <clears throat> with complaints of cramping that occurs just prior to menstruation. She has no known com comorbidities aside from depression, which is controlled with 50 milligrams of sertraline daily. She's got no known drug allergies, denies taking any other medications, and states her friends recommended ibuprofen, but she wants to know if there are any major side effects to worry about or interactions uh, before trialing it. So pertinent ed education points for Jane would be to educate her about the increased risk of GI bleed with co-administration of sertraline and NSAIDs. Um, recommend taking the NSAID with food or milk to reduce risk of GI bleed. And then let's make sure she's clear on the signs and symptoms related to GI bleed, which we've discussed. Moving into our OTC topical analgesic agents, this is an area of profound growth over the last five years or so, I would say. Uh, one agent that's recently become available OTC is the diclofenac sodium topical gel, which was previously prescription only. This is indicated for those small joint areas, um, hand, wrist, elbow, foot, knee, um, and ankle. And um, it's important to educate your patients that this agent is, again, not going to work immediately. So we're going to need to see continued use for about a week before patients are going to notice a significant response. Now, it is a little bit complicated to maintain compliance because patients are asked to apply this four times a day um, with a max of two body areas being utilized at any given time. The agent comes with this uh, dosing card, which um, allows them to measure out their um, dose in inches, uh, which equates to the number of grams that they're receiving. So smaller areas will get that two gram option, and then the larger areas will receive four grams. Um, when we talk about risk related um, to patients with exposure of NSAIDs versus these topical diclofenac agents. Um, as you can see here, the Cmax for diclofenac gel 1% is around 15, comparing that to a 75 milligram tablet being over 2000. Um, so when we look at the AUC of these agents, we see a, a dramatic difference um, with application and uh, route. So much lower risk of GI side effects with uh, topical NSAIDs compared to oral NSAIDs. But an important education point is not to utilize um, oral NSAIDs concomitantly with the topical agents. Um, this does increase their risk of AKI and rectal hemorrhage as well. Topical menthol acts as a counter irritant um, for minor aches and pains, joints, joint related issues, um, arthritis, strains, and um, back aches, things of that nature. In rare cases, some patients will experience a severe burn sensation, um, which can occur upon application. It's typically normal for patients to feel like it heats up and then cools off. Um, however, if this is you know, persistent or um, excessive to tolerance, obviously uh, we want patients, the patient to discontinue use um, and notify their provider. If the, if the patient's um, muscle aches persist greater than seven days, we recommend consulting a physician. And uh, we don't want them to do anything as far as covering up the area because um, <clears throat> this will increase the absorption and alter the kinetics of the drug. Topical lidocaine has also become very popular um, with our OTC formulations being patch creams and roll-on products. Um, it's, this is a good agent, especially for those individuals with neuropathic pain, um, but the labeling focuses more on um, minor indications. So uh, patients can apply one patch uh, no more than three to four times um, daily, and they'll need to remove it after every eight hour application. So this is different than the prescription lighted, lidocaine patch, which is a 5% strength that's allowed for 12 hours on, 12 hours off, um, max of four patches. So um, again, important for us to know as providers, you know, for recommending OTC dosing, what that looks like compared to what we're doing in-house. 
Um, and we want to make sure that patients are aware that they are not to use this with a heating pad um, <clears throat> or, you know, just sit out in the sun for long periods of time with this agent because it will increase absorption of the drug. Combination products, um, I just wanted to highlight to you the the abundance of agents that are combined with multiple products. Um, now, you know, when we look at this, we see acetaminophen partnered with caffeine, aspirin, um, diphenhydramine, um, and then even in our topical products, we have multiple combination agents. Um, now, when we're talking about caffeine, we can increase blood pressure, increase um, nervousness or sleep, um, sleeplessness, increase that heart rate as many of us experience when we have too much coffee. <laughs> and then diphenhydramine on the other side of that, um, causing some marked drowsiness or increasing sedation uh, along with other sedative related agents. So um, making sure that our patients are reading the labels is essential. One thing I wanted to note about um, combination products that include capsaicin is that um, if the patient has any allergies to chili peppers, uh, we would want them to avoid utilizing any capsicum related products. So um, it's just an important counseling point to know. Also, um, any contact with the eyes is going to cause significant pain to the patient. So we wanna make sure we're educating them to wash their hands um, after each application for any of these. And our last case presentation, Williams, a 45-year-old male being discharged from the hospital after suffering a motor vehicle accident. While his imaging indicates no structural damage to his spine, he reports still having lower back pain, which he rates a three out of 10 and describes as a dull ache. He reports relief in the past with the topical menthol methyl salicylate combination ointment. What education points should we consider as William prepares for discharge? Well, we wanna make sure he's clear about uh, the variation in concentrations and dosage forms, making sure he's reading those active ingredients. Um, do not utilize this product with a heating pad or any heat application, and making sure you wash your hands. Um, the mild warming and cooling sensations are to be expected, but if significant irritation occurs, we of course want him to discontinue. So um, to conclude the, some of the counseling points that I think are very important is making sure patients know to update their providers um, about all the medications they're taking, whether that's OTC, herbal, or prescription um, related agents. Also, following the dosing instructions for the recommended amount of uh, duration um, is very important to follow unless otherwise um, educated by your provider. Make sure that um, patients are reading all active ingredients, as many of those products uh, have overlapping active ingredients that are available OTC. And stop a product if uh, any of those side effects or symptoms occur um, that we've discussed today. And when we are discharging patients from the hospital, ensuring that they're educated on their OTC and prescription medications um, being and they're properly reconciled um, is very important to avoid therapeutic duplications where patients are taking OTC and prescription medications that overlap. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shake to um, provide some more education and emphasizing that discharge process. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, so as Dr. Johnson mentioned, uh, the last part of this presentation will discuss some resources um, and materials that we hope you'll find helpful when uh, discharging your patients. So there's a lot of, we have a lot of slides and unfortunately we don't have enough time to go through all of them. So hopefully you'll be able to download a PDF of the PowerPoint uh, slides and go through them um, at your, on your own time. Um, uh, and always feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, but to give a little bit of background of, on the Pain Assessment Management Initiative, um, I, Dr. Johnson mentioned previously on our disclosure slide, uh, that we've received various grants um, and sponsorship for this program. Um, it was started back in 2014. Uh, and the reason why we started this program is we really felt um, that we didn't have enough, uh, as providers, we didn't have enough materials uh, one for our patients and one to educate ourselves. Uh, we didn't feel like there were enough resources out there um, to help us manage our patients. Um, and really in 2014, this was before um, 
you know, the opioid uh, epidemic hadn't really reached its, uh, its, its peak yet. Um, you know, people were starting to hear about increasing death rates from prescription opioid use, but really it wasn't until 2016 that it became a uh, forefront um, in everyone's mind. So at this time, there really wasn't that much uh, in terms of resources and education materials available for providers. Now there's a plethora of, of uh, materials available in CMEs um, that are free um, and easy to access. So our initial focus was really looking at the acute care setting. Um, I'm an emergency medicine provider, um, and so my experience is grounded in that setting. So really our focus at that time was the ED trauma center and pre-hospital setting. Now we've expanded uh, to include more of a multidisciplinary approach where um, we have also moved into the inpatient setting as well as the outpatient setting. Um, and that's really how I we started collaborating with Dr. Johnson um, on many of our uh, on many of our resources and materials that we'll discuss later on. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, some of the materials and resources were really driven by nurses that we worked with, uh, with some of the advanced practice providers that we worked with, um, who helped us along the way in terms of really identifying uh, key areas that they felt were lacking um, and where we felt we really could make a difference. Um, and the other, the other um, area that we started touching on more recently was really the patient. So up until maybe a few years ago, we were really focusing on the healthcare provider. Uh, but then we realized we're really missing an important aspect here. We're missing the patient's perspective um, and really um, thinking about what, how could we help educate the patient? Uh, we started reading a lot more literature coming out about uh, patients and how uh, education, particularly pain education and um, understanding pain neuroscience, all of those things really um, can help drive um, or decrease pain scores and other pain outcomes. So we really felt like the patient was an important target as well um, to address with our PME resources. Um, this is a picture of our various um, PME team members, um, but we also work with uh, providers across the state. Um, actually across the, the country. Um, and we have partnerships with the Florida Hospital Association, as well as the Fl uh, Florida Society of Health System Pharmacists. Um, we, and we've been working with those two groups for, for many years now. This slide just shows the various um, stakeholders and collaborators we have worked with in the past and continue to, continue to work with. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, we have a lot of uh, resources and materials and unfortunately don't have time to go through them all. Um, I really highlighted the key ones that we'll talk about uh, today, uh, but the other ones are freely um, available on our website um, and the website address is there at the bottom. Um, so we'll talk about our discharge planning toolkit uh, for pain, um, as well as a program that we recently started about a year ago where we started providing certain uh, patient groups, those we deemed high risk, um, underfunded or unfunded, um, access to free over-the-counter analgesic starter kits um, and prompting an educational um, session with them on how they can use these products to help minimize or manage their, pa their pain at home and hopefully prevent uh, ED return rates and hospitalizations. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about our pain education and coaching consult service that was also recently developed. This is one of our more popular resources that we have available on our website. This is a discharge algorithm um, that we created, really just kind of highlighting the points that we felt were important to go over with the patient. So one is determining if the patient is safe for discharge. So for example, if they received any sedating type of medications or analgesics, um, making sure that they were in a state where they could go home. Um, also reviewing uh, the pain management plan uh, with the patient to make sure they really could access uh, the, um, the plan, uh, whether, you know, funding or um, transportation uh, to fill their prescriptions, um, and also discussing potential opportunities for um, over-the-counter and non-pharmacological options as well. Um, and then finally, incorporating um, some of our resources and materials that I'll go into in, in more detail later um, as part of this discharge process. Uh, so this is just a slide where that algorithm is blown up, and you can see um, in the purple column uh, here, we have several handouts listed, um, as well as some QR codes for some of our videos. Um, and we have uh, handouts in these QR codes that can be, um, really they're embedded within our EMR. Um, 
providers can access them by um, typing in a simple dot phrase and incorporating whichever handouts they feel is most applicable to their patient. Uh, we also have uh, hard copies of these materials that can also be given to the patient at the time of discharge. And really we found that some um, uh, of our nursing staff have really thought, uh, have really utilized some of these materials earlier on in a patient setting and not waiting until discharge. So the patient has time to read those materials and look it over and ask questions uh, prior to being discharged home. Uh, so part of this algorithm includes an assessment form. So this assessment form was uh, adapted from one that was published in the journal PMNR in 2012. Uh, we made some tweaks to it. Um, and you can see here, it basically touches on um, several different domains that can be impacted by pain. Um, and really going over this with the patient to help identify areas where the patient could use some help um, and education to help them realize that, you know, pain is complex and it impacts lots of different areas in our life. It can affect our sleep, it can affect um, our social interactions and things that we do, lifestyle choices that we make, such as smoking, um, the type of food we eat, drinking alcohol, all those things can have effects on our pain. Um, and so kind of driving home those points with the patient um, really can help them understand um, practices uh, that they can utilize at home to help manage their pain. And I should mention the algorithm, the assessment form also has some safety um, questions and areas to go over with the patient as well. This is a, a snapshot of our website and some of the materials that we have here. Um, so I, as I mentioned, it's all free access. So it, anybody can feel free to download these materials and actually modify them um, for your own hospital um, setting or outpatient setting. So some of our discharge materials, as I mentioned, um, are actually incorporated. Um, we use Epic in our at, within our um, at our hospital setting, and so we've incorporated them within our EMR. Uh, but we also have hard copies, and you can see a picture there of the trifold. Um, when it prints out, it prints out as one page, and then you physically have to fold it. Um, that can be given to the patient uh, either at the time of discharge or really any time during the the encounter. This is one that we've recently updated, just talking about safe practices when it comes to analgesics. Um, and we recently developed one for over-the-counter oral products. Um, we also have one for topical products. Um, and, and it talks about the different dosing and some of the warnings and precautions that patients should take um, that Dr. Johnson previously went over in her presentation. Uh, this is a list of our handouts and I've, I've put a red box around the ones that we felt were um, most applicable to this summit. Um, the stars indicate the ones that are most downloaded, um, but really we have um, resources and handouts um, that can be adapted for use. Uh, and so if you feel like there's something that needs to be tweaked or changed, we'd love to hear from you, um, but you can also make changes on your own. Uh, this is a postcard. Um, that is actually um, also embedded within our EMR. Um, and it prints out, not as a postcard, but it prints out with this information where patients can access these videos um, either in the hospital or during their um, healthcare visit um, or at home uh, to provide tips for them for uh, how to manage their, their pain at home. And there's four different videos that go over different topics, including over-the-counter um, analgesics that they can use. So as, as Dr. Jen Johnson mentioned in her, in her PowerPoint, uh, in her um, part of the, the lecture that, you know, when you go to um, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, any, any, any place that sells over-the-counter uh, pain products, uh, it can be pretty overwhelming. And that was something we heard quite a bit from our patients um, that, you know, I know that there's products out there. I don't really know if it's safe to take with my prescribed medications. My doctor didn't tell me that I could use it, um, so I'm not using them. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's okay to use um, ibuprofen with Tylenol. Is it okay to use topicals? It just seemed like there was a lot of confusion. And so to really try to address this issue, um, that's really what prompted our over-the-counter handout and materials. Um, and this discussion with our patients, um, we realized also, you know, 
accessing these over-the-counter products is also an issue. So one, patients may not have, uh, it may not be covered by their insurance. They may not have enough funds um, to, to use these products. Um, they may not have transportation to get to the to the um, locations that sell these products. We work in an underserved, um, socially vulnerable patient population. And so that was a big barrier for use uh, for some of these products. And we felt um, that that was something that we could potentially address to maybe limit or decrease reliance on opioids and other, um, and also to help patients manage their pain at home. Um, so we provide patients with four different options that they can um, use at home. So they're actually physically discharged uh, with these medications, uh, a small, a short supply of these medications. So it includes acetaminophen, both tablet and liquid formulations are avail available, uh, ibuprofen, diclofenac gel, and lidocaine patches, and this is the 4%, so not the prescribed 5%. Um, and it also comes along with the handout as well as some education um, done by our um, either the, either providers or by our pain coach, which I'll talk later on about. Um, and all of these materials are um, available and just has to be ordered within our EMR. Uh, so talking about our pain coaching service, um, so another aspect of, of our of our program is really, you know, what, as I mentioned before, really looking at the patient and the education that they need. You know, we're all busy. Um, especially with COVID, um, providers are really stressed and um, there's sometimes we feel like we don't have enough time to spend with our patients. So really having that extra support, that extra team member to help maybe go over some of these patient safety issues, um, as well as talking to them about safe um, pain management and just about pain in general. Um, a lot of our patients really don't understand pain. It's some mysterious um, condition that they have and they don't really understand why uh, pain has really kind of dominated their lives. And really taking that time, 15 minutes, 20 minutes with the patient and kind of, uh, there's this thing um, that I came across when reading one of these um, education uh, articles regarding pain management. You know, you have to de-educate to re-educate. So really kind of demystifying that whole pain process, talking a little bit about pain neuroscience. Um, it's really, uh, our patients are really responsive to that. Um, and I'm surprised at how receptive they are to something as simple as just explaining to them about pain, fight or flight response, um, inflammation, and all those things. Um, they really seem to understand and grasp those concepts and seem to be more open to trying, um, you know, non-opioid type uh, products as well as non-pharmacological products. Um, so you can see in this picture, this is our pain coaching team um, or three members of our pain coaching team. We also have, uh, they're standing around this purple cart and within that cart, which we have located in different clinical areas. Um, and now we've recently expanded to the outpatient setting. Um, there's different uh, products um, or and materials that are in there. So aromatherapy, virtual reality, an acupressure device. There's various things in the cart that any healthcare provider um, can pull out for their patient um, and discuss it uh, with, with them. Um, and if anybody's interested in learning more about this, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, so some, some institutions have reached out. They want to uh, recreate this type of program within their hospital setting. Um, and so this is, um, we've had actually lots of requests asking for, you know, the script, the pain coach script. What is it that you actually discuss with the patient? This is a shortened version of it. Um, so first the patient, um, you know, first we try to find out if the patient's even interested in, in, in being approached by the pain coach. And if they say yes, then we start, you know, explaining to them a little bit about what the, the point of this interaction is um, and really reaffirming that nothing is going to be taken away. That was actually a big learning point for us. Patients got scared thinking that we were altering their pain management plan, that maybe they weren't going to get what it was, what medications they were expecting to get, especially those who may be on long-term opioids. And we just have to redirect them, letting them know this is just a conversation. This is really just something to start um, thinking about other alternatives or other ways other than just reliance um, on opioids uh, for managing pain. Um, and really, once we kind of framed it in that type of way, um, patients really responded to that. Um, and then we basically just kind of go over some of the things that we talked about earlier, pain neuroscience, um, 
having a discussion with the patient about what they've tried, what have they, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, um, seeing if they're open, if it seems like they're having a lot of stress in their life, maybe talking about some distraction techniques and other non-pharmacological techniques um, if, the, if it seems applicable to the patient and if it's safe for them to do so given their comorbid conditions. Um, this is a, um, a picture of some of our toolkit items um, that the patient um, can use either during their encounter and or take home with them. Um, so it's really meant to be tailored towards uh, for the patient, depending on what their interest is and in what we feel they would most benefit from. Um, and so this is just um, uh, continuing the slide of the different options that are available. Um, and so the point of the slides I just wanted to mention, there are some um, rules that you have to follow when giving patients um, quote unquote free products. So you have to make sure that you're under a certain dollar amount and all of these products, um, given the amount that we order and with the specific vendors that we use, um, which people, um, other institutions have reached out to us for the list of vendors so we can provide that if anybody's interested. Um, it does come to less than the uh, Medicare beneficiary inducement rules. Um, so, you know, it's well under the $15. And this also includes the over-the-counter um, top, uh, over-the-counter products that we um, give to the patients as well. So all of those things combined, um, for the most part, is under $15. And um, there's one or two items in there that might exceed it. So we have to be careful in how we, in the items that we pick, just to make sure that one, it's relevant for the patient, and two, that it's less than the $15 per visit amount set by the, the government. So we have a couple of patient examples, which I don't think we have time to go through, but basically um, feel free to read them on your own. This really just kind of highlights uh, the type of approach that we take with our patients when it comes to determining factors that might be influencing their pain um, and ways that we can use our materials to help the patient, um, one, understand their pain, deal with their pain and manage their pain once they go home. Um, and then the last two examples, uh, cases here are really um, real patients that we've encountered and some of their testimonials on um, how they felt this program has helped, helped them manage their, their pain. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about this analogy. This is actually developed by the American Chronic Pain Association. Um, and this product or this analogy, pain analogy, has really resonated with our, with our patients. It really kind of helps them understand um, the importance of using a multimodal type of approach when dealing with their pain. Um, and really, it's just that, you know, your pain is like a car with four flat tires. And we use the stress ball, stress car um, to kind of drive home that point. Um, and each, um, each of your tires, you know, if you have chronic pain, um, it's flat. So you're a car with four flat tires. So medications, specifically opioids, might pump up one of your tires, but how are you going to pump up the other three? And that really kind of leads to a discussion about different lifestyle choices the patient may be making and other ways that but other things that we can do to try to pump up those other tires. Um, so we've learned a couple of things um, along the way. Um, one, there's some some patients where um, pain is, as I mentioned, is just very complex. There's lots of different, um, you know, thinking about that whole biopsychosocial model of pain, there's a lot of contribu contributing factors to pain. And it may be beyond the scope of the session that you have with your patient to really kind of delve into those issues, a lot of psychological and spiritual aspects um, related to pain. And at that point, it might be it, it might be prudent to defer that to a counselor or somebody else who might have expertise in that area. Um, the other thing that we realized is we really needed to work well um, closely with the, the treating providers, because sometimes the patient might provide or disclose information to us that was not disclosed to the medical, uh, to the primary team. So we really feel like we need to have a close relationship and relay any information we find out from the, from the um, patients. Um, this is just some more testimonials and feedback that we've received from our providers. Um, and then this last statement is just, you know, our program is more than just um, what I mentioned here. And please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or to um, go to our website for more information. Um, in terms of outcomes, we're just starting to look at this, you know, really kind of measure the, the effectiveness and um, impact we've been making. Um, so we started um, uh, a set of order panels for specific pain conditions um, in the emergency department. 
um, as well as, as I mentioned, pain coaching service and that over-the-counter um, toolkit program that we started. Um, and we've really started to look at years one data comparing it to baseline. And we've noticed that we have made some impacts. There's been a dramatic decrease um, in the amount of opioids that we're, um, one, using in the hospital, as well as prescribing. There's an increase in the amount of opioid alternatives that we've been prescribing um, and using in the, um, in the hospital, um, as well as um, for certain pain conditions like low back pain, um, and musculoskeletal pain, we've noticed a reduction in hospital admissions um, and 30-day return visits for pain. Uh, this is just a list of the different, um, uh, for year 2020, the different um, uh, programs and institutions that have reached out to us for, uh, for materials um, and our um, resources from us um, that they would like to adapt and learn more about so they can recreate this program within their own um, institution. And this is our contact information. Thank you, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Shake for your presentations. We'll now begin the Q&A session led by Roseanne Hemet, Quality Programs Manager at the American Heart Association. As a reminder, you can still submit questions for our presenters through the Q&A feature. And Roseanne, I will turn it to you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Shake, so much for your presentations. The, we have some questions that have come in. Um, I'm gonna take one from the queue. Um, for a patient that may prefer an electronic access, um, can you recommend any apps that may assist in patient um, in pain um, medication management or selection that you've heard of? So, and you're specifically talking about ones that you can download to your phone. So yeah. I know there was one in production. I don't think it's quite available yet. Um, there are a lot of, I know like um, uh, dosing guides that can be, that are physical, um, but I don't know of any that I would recommend um, that are available on the phone quite yet. Okay. Um, um, I know there's some for it, like for pediatric, um, but it's not specific to pain. It's just pediatric dosing and that's pretty good, but for adults, I don't know of any. Uh, that I would recommend. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is for Dr. Johnson. Um, how do we know if a patient has a sensitivity rather than identifying it as an allergy? Yeah, so that's something we come across all the time. Um, it's really if the patient is, you know, um, describing it, we get this a lot with codeine, for example, right? They tell you that they're allergic to codeine, but it's, um, you know, when you dig a little bit deeper and start asking those questions, it's that they have a little bit of GI upset. So, um, you know, we want to ask open-ended questions to the patient. Well, what happens when you take naproxen? What happens when you take aspirin, right? Get a description um, from them to try to get a, an idea of whether we're dealing with sensitivity or a true um, allergic reaction. So, patient has full body hives and they have lip swelling and they have trouble breathing, well, then that is a true allergy. Um, any of those indicators would be um, cause for concern where I wouldn't want to utilize that agent in the patient. But if they say they get a little bit of itching or, um, you know, maybe it gave them some GI upset, well, I would consider that more of a sensitivity. Thank you. This next question is for Dr. Shake. Um, do you consider neurodiversity and their strategies for PAMI? Um, actually, no, I don't think I've come across that. Um, are you able to elaborate more on that? Um, every Everyone learns in a different manner, in a different way. Um, and so I know that um, when we're doing patient education in a hospital, many times family are uh, a company uh, because quite possibly the patient uh, might not understand because they learn in a different way. So that's an example of some neurodiversity that may need to get approached. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. Um, whenever we have access to family members or caregivers, we always try to, if with the patient's permission, we always try to include them in, in, in our discussions. Um, and it's really more of a um, something that the 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 coaching team, when they approach the patient, um, they really try to figure out based on the patient interactions um, so that they can tailor their the language that they're using, tailor the type of uh, messaging that they're getting across dependent on their um, on the patient's understanding and um, 
uh, their background. Uh, because not all patients, uh, especially our patient population, have um, we really see quite a diverse type of patient population, and uh, they don't necessarily have access uh, to uh, to medical care or limited access to medical care, and even their health literacy level is quite low. So, making sure that we really use language that they can understand, especially those complex. Um, uh, terms and terminology we may use when describing pain neuroscience, we really try to be sensitive to that. Um, and so I, that's a really good point that that's something to consider um, whenever approaching a patient um, to educate them. Wonderful. And that leads me to like a caveat off of that. Is there a certain reading level that all of your printed materials are geared toward? Yes. So they are, we try to make sure that they're all at an eighth grade reading level or, or below. Um, and to be honest, our, we use EPIC, and it's supposed to be at an eighth grade reading level or below as well, the discharge instructions that we use. But when I read them, sometimes I get confused. And so I think um, that's why we make sure even when we do give them handouts or materials, we actually go through it with the patient to make sure they actually understand if we need to write notes on there. Because maybe they understood most of it, but there's one sentence they, they didn't quite grasp or understand. So we do try to make sure it's more than just handing them the handout. Um, we try to actually sit with them and go through it to make sure they understand what is being communicated on that, that resource. Excellent. Um, this is the last question um, for Dr. Johnson. Alternative medicine is quite popular these days, as you know. Are there any supplements that have adverse drug reactions that we should be asking about? Yes, so that's a great point. Um, I would ask about all of them, to be honest. Um, so there are certain ones, you know, uh, valerian root, for example, um, certain agents that send up kind of a more of a red flag than others. But because uh, many of the herbal supplements are not regulated um, by the FDA, um, those rely on patient reporting of adverse effects before they'll prompt an investigation into the product. So we don't always have a, a, a very clear understanding of uh, what concentration and what active ingredients are actually in any of the um, herbal products, um, aside from those that go through like the US pharmacopoeia, which there are some supplements that do. Um, there's one particular brand I can think of, the, the Nature uh, nature made brand um, has USP endorsement. Um, but unfortunately, many of the others that are manufactured, we, we don't have a great understanding of exactly what's in them. So I do caution patients with that. And you can screen for that on, in, on common apps like clinical pharmacology or micromedics entering in some of those herbals with the patient's um, prescription recommend regimen. But I always check it against the database because there's just so many variations out there now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheik and Dr. Johnson for your presentation today. It was so informative. Um, we thank you for your time and your expertise. Back to Liz. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and guests who participated in today's Pain and Hypertension Management Summit. We know you all have very busy schedules and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Recordings of today's presentations will be made available at heart.org forward slash pain management within the next few weeks. You can view and download the slides from each of today's sessions by clicking on the sessions listed on the agenda page. On behalf of the American Heart Association, thank you. This concludes our event.